attacked yesterday morning by actually I don't know how many guys we were surrounded uh, they were shooting rockets RPGs at us 14 wounded 9 killed my best buddy uh, there's a lot of shit. Bullet holes and everything. This is what used to be a humpy. They blew the fuck out of it. My name is Scott Stanoski. I was a private first class with the 173rd Airborne Company. Um, we were chosen few. Uh, I served three years and eight months in Italy. Did two tours to Afghanistan. Uh, things didn't go the way I wanted it, so I got out. Well, the getting was good. <laughs> Armies changed. And, um, and I live in New York. I own my own business, and I work on Fort Drum, um, so I still deal with soldiers every day. Um, and I'm here to tell my story. Um, but I got into country in January, um, and it was just about to kick off. And, I mean, you don't experience, you don't realize it until you hear that first gunshot. Then you realize this is real. Um, the fighting season's kicking off, and you could definitely tell from going from one tick a day to five ticks a day, ten ticks a day. Um, just, and it, it wasn't a scheduled. It wasn't like, oh, we know we're gonna get hit at five in the morning. It was, it was, it was at random, and it was like fighting ghosts. They were, they're a lot smarter than you think they are. For being the type of nation they are, they are very, very intelligent. And they, they're not afraid to die. That's what separates them. That's what makes them so powerful is that they're not afraid to die. Uh, there was rumors that they were going to close down Bella. Bella's mortars were going to come to Blessing uh, and replace us because it was just the proper thing to do. They've, they've lived a harder lifestyle. Um, they dealt with more. It was kind of like a little vacation for them. So us chosen motors, we got attached to go on this mission to give them a break because they were closing down Bella. And <clears throat> it's funny because my buddy Abad and I, we sat down and Abad and I had a lot of chemistry. It was short chemistry, but we were both young, we were both privates. He came from Battle Company. One of our soldiers replaced him. They swapped. Um, There's some uh, confliction out there. In, in a battle company in the Korangal, so he came over um, three months prior to Wanat, and we we had um, we made history. Abad was a guy that just no matter what you did, he was there to support you 100. percent And uh, army's all about discipline. Now it's not, um, but we would get smoked. We he would sit and lean in front rest with me, even though he didn't get in trouble. Um, I left my radio in the barber shop, but he, he was there 100%. So we sat down. We got news that we were going out to Winnat. We had talked to the Bravos. The Bravos, they, they, they went out there multiple times, and they would get hit. And um, they were scared, but it, it was like, it was the last mission. It was the last mission. We just wanted to get it done and over with. It can't be any worse than anything else that we ever endured. Um, but as it soaked in, it was just like, you got that saying, three strikes and you're out. 
and we have been sitting on two strikes, 2.1, 2.2, just milking those strikes, not trying to hit the third strike. And when that was the third strike, and the Bravos knew it, and, and you could see it. Um, normally, we're all gung ho. We we missions really didn't scare us because we knew that our brothers would have our back. And we were gonna go out, kill some motherfuckers, come back, eat chow, and live another day. But you could see it with the Bravos. They lollygagged around. It was like they would, they didn't really want to go. Um, they knew what was gonna happen. It felt like the leadership knew what was gonna happen. Um, there was jokes going around on how we were all gonna die. And here we are getting ready to go or not. It's the last two weeks of uh, last two weeks of our tour that we got left in Afghanistan. And from the intel, there should be how many guys should there be? Sit over 100, right? Over 100. They got fighting positions set up. We're going there. We got two weeks left. It's bullshit. I'm gunning. Mark 19. It's quite possibly our worst mission. This is what my turret looks like. Here's my number one man, and here's my second number one man. They're both the same, same so, standing. I know we're getting ready to go to Wanat, <laughs> and uh, they've got Dishka set up. They've got fucking fighting positions. rifles. Fighting positions, OPs, let them know. But the only thing that I can concentrate on is just a dude to my left right now that I thought there was a weight program in the army. So why don't you go ahead and scan over there? What do you guys say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Woo. Can you do the video recording of our last days? Yes. Wow, I'm gonna die. We're all so, gonna die! What? It's our last mission, probably the worst one. I've survived 14 months of deployment and I'm gonna die in the last <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse me, the last one. At least so. a lot of people won't owe any debts. That's true. I'll be in heaven Whoa. laughing at you, but you're still in the fire. Like, oh. These guys have served 15 months in Afghanistan and they were so close to going home. So close to going home. Abad was ecstatic because. It was a few days before we got news or whatnot that everybody was giving given their rough date of when they were gonna leave country. And uh, Bod was on the first ones to go because Battle Company came in first, so they were the first ones to get out. And he was technically part of Battle Company um, besides those last three months. So he was excited to go, and a lot a lot of people were just ready to get out of there. They were ready to get out of there, out of there. So it came down to being scared, being like, why can't they just let us have a break? The new unit's ripping in. Why can't the new unit do this? Just give us a break. But some somebody's ego was all about doing it, um, and us doing it. Um, we had the reputation that any mission given to us, we completed. Um, no matter what happened, it was completed. So we had that little chip on the shoulder, like, if they want shit to get done, they're going to send Chosen Company. <laughs> I mean, it, it was inevitable, but we knew it was going to happen. We knew we were going to be chosen. Um, we didn't want it. And I remember sitting in the hooch with Abad, and um, we smoked a cigarette. And I remember the first time I met him, uh, he had new ports. He's like, you ever smoke a cigarette? And I was like, no. Nah. I mean, my dad smoked for years. My mom's like, you're never going to smoke. It's so bad for you. And I was like, ah, ma, I'm never going to smoke. But after dealing with that, the best way to get rid of all that stress was just to sit down and smoke a cigarette. It didn't mean, I, at first it was just, it gave me a really big body high and it felt good and then it felt like ass and then your lungs. But, Abad introduced me to my first cigarette, which was a Newport, and it hasn't stopped since. <laughs> um, Do you like menthol? <laughs> I didn't like menthol. Um, to this day, I smoke Marble Reds, but it was just the fact that that was that piece of utopia that we had. It just, it didn't matter if you, you chain smoked that cigarette 30 seconds. It was 30 seconds of, of, of 
freedom of, of just your time, your your moment where you didn't have a worry in the world, you were just relaxed smoking your cigarette. It's like sitting on your back porch, watching the sunrise, smoking a cigarette. Here we go. This is what it's like when it's really hot in Afghanistan. But what do you say? Too hot with being right now. Too hot. I'm thinking 100, 120. You get really lazy. You get most of your work done. We're building a fob. Is the king chief? And if you did see more to I don't know what to say, I'm just tired. Say something to your wife? I'm supposed to post it on my MySpace. Hi baby, I miss you. Take care of my gummy bear. Get back to the story. Um That's when the the few days before when not happened. He had told me that his fiance Christina, which was something amazing, he told me that she was pregnant, and that he had found out a week prior. And I was like, "Congratulations!" We were talking about it. And I was like, "How's it gonna be?" We just we reminisce all, all everything that we had talked about. I feel like he knew because he. He stared death in the face more times than I had. And I feel like he knew. He knew, but he just wanted to get it off his chest if he wasn't able to. Um, he told me we went over all our plans, all, all the trips that we wanted to take, and uh, all the dreams that, the endless nights that we had just sitting on guard, just making plans and dreams of what we would do. And it all flashed back, and it was really heart sickening for me because, as as for myself, I didn't, I didn't really have anything to come back to. I mean, I wasn't. I'm not close to my family. Um, my parents didn't know I was in Afghanistan, so I never got any letters. I was just a nobody in a place serving for somebody. Um, I was there for the experience. I got more for more than what I bargained for. That's for sure. Um. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, Count Blessing, y'all getting ready to fly in. Who went in and went out first? The Bravos did the day before. There was a patrol that was expected to go out there and set up the CP before we flew in. Um, we were ready uh, to go on the DZ. We were waiting for the birds. The Bravos moved out. Um, the birds came. We loaded up our gear and <clears throat> sitting in the Chinook. And I don't know if I was shaking or if it was just the birds shaking. It was hard to interpret. Um, it was quiet. Normally we joke around, and we talk about banging each other's girlfriends when we get back, and <laughs> just just going at it, but. That flight seemed to be the longest flight that I had rode the entire time I was there, and um, it was fairly close. I, I I don't know why it took so long. Maybe because we didn't want to be there. Maybe maybe they weren't ready to land. Maybe.
we got there, we we uh we mostly ate most of our snacks. Then then we started running out of water. We were just working nonstop. Um, they had dropped off. The, the Chinooks brought in some Hescos. Um, they were 8x8 Hescos, and they were huge. They were huge. We started setting them up, and by day two, we had them all set up, and we started figuring out that we were running out of food and water. Um, they told us that there was a caravan lead, leaving from Blessing to go to Wanat, and it should have been, on, been there the next day, which would have been day three and it never showed up um so as soldiers we always made plans plans plan b was um brostrom and Dzwick started collecting money we were going to buy rice and ice because doc had brought in the chlorine tablets and we could we could do drink the water from the river as long as it was treated but I mean, the locals told us they could get, get us ice, which was, shit, that, that's like gold in Afghanistan. That, <laughs> that, that is like, it, we were like, that was the first time I ever, ever, ever seen ice in Afghanistan. And these locals brought it. They brought this big chunk of ice. It was dirty, but it was ice. It was fucking cold when it was 140 degrees. So it, it was nice. Um, they made a... It, it was actually really expensive for a block of ice and some rice. Um, we all got portionate amounts of rice, but the rice wasn't the biggest deal because we've eaten rice the entire time over there. But some food's better than no food. So it was rice and ketchup. That was that was the the premier gourmet food in Afghanistan. If you brought from the local, it was plain rice. You would add ketchup to it or salt, pepper. I've seen a body eat it with mustard. That was. Why didn't Blessing send more water and food right away? You have any idea? They said that they had sent it, but it never showed up. Same with the construction crew that was coming out. It, it, it never showed up. We, it was like staring off in the distance because you could see the roads in the valleys. And nothing, nothing was coming through when not. Um, it was like a ghost town. Um, there was locals there. We set up right next to a bazaar. The bazaar looked flourished. It looked like it, it was popping, and there was locals there. But you never, never seen anybody come in or go out. Fucking Afghanistan! This is Afghanistan. tow missile, um, pretty much scanning the ridge line, um, tired, could barely keep my eyes open. Um, my guard relief came about zero, zero 0350, they usually were 10 minutes early, um, I get off at zero 04, and uh, he replaces me, I told him I didn't see anything, I didn't see anything, no movements, my tired guard shift. Um, it was just a long, long shift. It seemed to last forever. So he replaced me. I walk out of the, the tow missile truck and um, walk back to the mortar, mortar pit. And uh, it came across the radio that we're going to stand two. And stand two was pretty much just to um, be ready in case any ha anything happened. Most most of the firefights that we had gotten into is early, early, early morning or late late at night there was always stand two in the mornings and at night and that's when everybody everybody's awake there's no one sleeping everybody's in their fighting position ready 
I'm sorry if I asked you the question. I wasn't military. Um, so we're in stand two. It's not like mortars. We really weren't there looking down our sights, ready to go. We were there ready by the radio, waiting for a fire mission. So I'm sitting next to Abad. Abad is the happiest I've seen him in a very, very long time. And the reason he was happy is the bird was supposed to pick him up at 09. He was going home. And uh, uh, we were just talking about everything. He would get my room ready for when I got back because I was on a different lift than he was. Uh, everybody had their different times they were leaving depending on when they came into country. Since I came in late, I was going to be the last to leave. He was just telling me how he can't wait to be home with his girl, and he can't wait for her to give birth to his baby girl. And it, we were just ripping through plans, just sitting next to each other, ripping through plans. And um, it was funny because the water fountain, we, we, we heard that. We heard that before we set up, but everything started getting muddy when I got back to the hooch and sat down to him my cot had actually sunk and we were like oh wow it's just it is what it is um we had no idea no idea and then <clears throat> it comes to me and I've talked to a lot of my buddies that experienced it it, it seemed like one gunshot I heard one gunshot ring through the valley and a bod falls out of his cot face first into the ground. At that point I just feel like cover. Everybody's just hitting the ground with cover now. RPGs, I swear the valley rang so many rounds just started flying everywhere. Snaps, cracks, popples. The mountainside looked like people were holding sparklers. It just lit up the whole entire valley. Um, we hit the ground. The Hescos weren't filled. There wasn't much. There wasn't much for cover. Um, once we got our bearings, uh, Sergeant Phillips looked at me and he, he, he told me that we needed to get on mortar to and get ready for mission. Start firing the targets that we had pre-planned. Check. One, two. This is the life of a mortar man. Check. You guys are rolling on delay? Yeah. Woohoo! Looks cool. Yeah, right 100 and then right 150. His first time hanging around. Mm -hmm. Four, three, eight, Booyah, shakra! Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and shoot it. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hold on, hold on. Get this photo out. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my old ways. Letting some contractors, some uh, engineers, hang it, hang their first rounds. Hang it. Fire. Send it. Woo! Oh fuck! Yeah. I'm not on the shot area. I got it. Do you? Yes, I do. What's up, Bubba? Good man. Gun is up again. Alright, let's look at this. Big explosion. It should be right in that little battle. Yeah, Just on the right. I think it's going to go Just to the left. I didn't say splash. She said splash. Oh, what? Oh, too much. It was Chavez. I didn't even hear it. Right over. Oh man, it went over. No explosion. Damn it. Oh, oh there it is. I could have been having a good time watching that. You fucked it up. Thanks, watch out. But well, Willie Pete's gonna land short. Now. Oh! That's Willie Pete right there. <laughs> Look at that fucking. Fly yeah, I'll try that. Fly the fuck out there. Nice! That was fucking good group right there. Uh -huh. Rocket 9-5, chosen 9-2. There's a fire. All rounds fire observed safe-ish. Non-target, nice shoot. That was... That's how we roll. That was dodge. fucking badass. Yeah, Those were all right on top of that bitch. Fucking Bogar. What? Fuck my fucking deal. Oh, there's a good fire going up there.
two six nine two. Yeah, Roger. Uh, just one round, I didn't see it landing a little bit behind the move. I think the delay was buried it a little bit more, something to the smooth, but the drop 100 brought it into view. Uh, so I think we're good. And uh, is that, that all he wants? Is that good? Roger, that's good. Dylan, over. Dylan, all 9 2 up. So I'm going to hang around. Hang it. 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 Okay. Right. Special. Okay, this time it was Chavez, okay? Look out, Gilmore. Shit. God damn. Boom! Right on top. Okay. I am Jimmy Kata. Oh, there it is. Can we light it with Willie Pino? Probably gonna drop it again. Still on the back side of the ridge. Drop five zero. Abad didn't get up. Um. At that point in time, everything is, 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 is just a, a hectic mess. We had engineers that we had never, never served with. They were getting in our way. We told them just to stay down and return fire. Um, What's the lighting like? The lighting is, it, it, it's just breaking light. It's like that point where you need headlights, but when you turn on your headlights, you don't even know if they're on. Um, that type of, the sun is barely showing, you barely can see what's going on, but you can see. Um, Sergeant Phillips and I, Zuma, quit it. I'm sorry. Hey. I can eat the bone. There. Stop. Jeez. Is that going to fuck you up, Scott? This no, 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 no. You want me to put them all away? No, you're good. All right, I might have to like discipline at some point. <laughs> um, Sergeant Chavez and, and Sergeant Gilmore start working at on a bad, and I kind of phase off for that because I knew I had a job to do. Sergeant Phillips was one badass motherfucker, and when he told you to do something, you did it. And um, we start firing targets, and no, I'm I'm tracking ahead myself right now. We didn't get to the mortar, mortar tube. We started firing back. There was a push behind the Hescos. And the push behind the Hescos was three to four guys, um, middle aged. Um, there was this about four inch gap between um, the left corner of the Hescos from the back wall and the six footers meeting up to the eight footers. There was about a four inch gap and we saw an AK come through and start unloading inside the motor pit. Um, I don't know who, someone someone got him. The AK dropped on top of the ammo pit. He dropped if he he not existed anymore. They started climbing the trees. The funny thing is, is <clears throat> those Hescos weren't full. They could have literally just sat behind the Hescos and just mowed us all right down. But they didn't know that. As of any other intelligence they've had or any other attacks they've had, those Hescos have been full. They've been protecting us. The so they got time. inside the wire? To get into the mortar pit, to put that gun through there, they had to get inside? Well, the thing is, is the, there was only Constantino wire around the whole entire cop, which is about maybe, if you're lucky, two feet. It depends on how far you stretch it out to cover a distance. Um, the more stretched out is more gaps, more able just to walk right over it. Right. Um, the Constantina wire was right on the edge. We were right on the edge right of the cop the because there was about maybe a 500 square foot little, little mud hut behind us, mud house, and then it dropped down into the gorge to the river. Right. So we were tucked in real close. Um, honestly, they could have went into the house, jumped from a window into the tree, and then just had us right there. Yeah. Um, 
Once we started seeing them push up in, we went to the outside of the mortar pit. It was pretty much, we had turned our backs to what we thought was secure. And we had to fight off people climbing trees and coming around into the DZ. Um, because the DZ was right next to the mortar pit. It was just this terrace that was probably maybe 300 square feet um, where they landed all the birds. And it was just open, just a string of Constantina wire. Um, I don't know how they got in, but they were, they were in. They were already in the in the wire in the beginning. Um, so we got pushed out of the mortar pit by those guys breaching the backside of the mortar pit by shooting in between the cracks of the hescos and climbing the trees. Once that threat was eliminated, that's when Sergeant Phillips asked me to go to the mortar tube. We get on our first target. Abad's still getting treated, and you just hear screams, endless screams. We fire three rounds, three 120 rounds at the first target. And no shit you not, as a gunner, I'm sitting next to the site. The tube is off my right hand side. Sergeant Phillips is behind me. Sergeant Phillips actually gunned the mission because the bot was down. I was I was assistant gunner, which is the ammo bearer. I hang the rounds, I prep the rounds, we fire the rounds. Sergeant Phillips was gunning and shit you not, an RPG flew flies right between us. It gets lodged in these canisters of prepped mortar rounds. I'm telling you we have about 400 rounds of prepped ammo of Willie P, HE, Alum, all the 50 cal was right there. That RPG flew right in between me and Sergeant Phillips and hit those, those ammo cans. There's only thing on your mind at that point in time. You're dead. You, you that whole that whole cop is dead. When the RPG hit the ammo cans, we instantly decided that we needed to go. We needed to go. And I to this day it eats at me because I had left Abad. At that point in time I didn't know Abad wasn't in the fight. He was getting treated. I didn't know if he was already passed away. I didn't know anything. All I knew is that my leadership was evacuating the mortar, mortar position. We were going to run through the field past the 60 to the CP and we were going to reinforce that. We started seeing the ANA run away. So any coverage we had to uh, it was the northwest side of us was gone. If they were going to come in, they were going to pinpoint us down. We had guys coming from the DZ. We had, we had witnessed guys climbing the trees. We eliminated that threat. It was only inevitable once they knew that the ANA was there and no one to fight in that position. And I feel bad to this day because I just booked it. I booked it along with everybody else. And halfway, halfway, we finally realized that no one had grabbed a bod. And Sart Chavez... And I think, who was the art, um, man, who was Captain Myers RTO? Um, Gilmore. It wasn't Gilmore. Haas. 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 They went and back and got a bod. And we covered fire for them. And Krupa was in the 50 kill at CP, covering fire for him, and they they were bringing back a bod. That's when Sergeant Chavez got shot in the leg. That's when Phillips and I went back and escorted them back. Um, we get into the CP, and there's some wounded there, and we lay a bod down in the foxhole, and I started talking to a bod. At that point in time, I had one minute where I felt secure. And a bot is shivering. He's staring away. He's staring away. And he grabs me because Captain Myers was talking to me, asking if I could get the 60. 
pretty much asking me to sign my death wish because 60 was right there in the middle of the cop, no cover. We already knew that I had lost anything that would have gave me security past the mortar section. So all we had was Krupa on the 50 cal. And I respectively told Captain Myers, there's no way. There's no way. And Abad grabs me and he pulls me into the, like, pulls me down into the foxhole and he looks straight in. This is the first time we made eye contact and he looks straight in to my eyes and he told me, tell my gummy bear I love her. And he drops. Man, did that hit me like a freight train. I had gone through so much with this kid and he was early 20s. I don't even think he was 21 yet. And it just, it, it really, really hit me. And we threw a Wooby, which is this army blanket. We, th we threw it over him and I, I just, I couldn't function him with him just being gone. And then all of a sudden, as we were get, collecting our bearings, um, we heard the, a huge explosion. A huge explosion. And then like 10 seconds later, this pre-cooked off tow missile lands right in front of us. Dead nuts right in, front, in, in the CP. And you hear the fan whizzing. And that fan whizzed and that... That was a sign of that it was about to cook off. And I seen Sergeant Phillips. He gets up. He grabs this fucking missile. No weapon on him. Not a... I'm telling you, this guy was one badass motherfucker. He grabbed this tow missile. He picks it up with all his might. He runs to the edge of the Humvee. And he runs out past the mortar, the 60 millimeter mortar, and he throws it. I don't see him for like five minutes. And next thing you know, he comes baseball sliding in to the foxhole next to Obad. And we were like, holy shit, you made it. You saved us all. Metal line. Captain Myers asked me again, it was roughly 30 minutes, we were returning fire, returning fire, weapon systems started breaking down on the terrace and up at top side. They were telling us that they were pressing in and that they needed reinforcements. The guys at top side were talking to Myers, Meyer in contact? Do you know, with top side or him and Brostrom were Myers was down in, at the CP with right. us. Right. Um, Brostrom was up at top side. Um, did you guys have good communication? Do you know what was going up, going off on top side? Or I knew that they were in contact. Well, everybody was in contact. Bullets flying everywhere. You didn't really know exactly who was in contact, where was the contact coming from. It was pretty much just shoot to kill. Mm -hmm. And Captain Myers asked some people to go up and reinforce top side. So that's when Sergeant Phillips, Sergeant Gilmore, and Sergeant Quick, they left me with Captain Myers to help him and Hayes. And they go up just with their weapon systems. And shit, I don't hear for them for 30 minutes. Nothing. Um, Hayes was the RTO for Captain Myers down at the CP. He was the one talking with everybody. They start saying that their weapons were going down and that they were running out of ammunition. Captain Myers asked me if I could get the, the 60 again. I peek my head out, there's bullets flying everywhere, and I look at him and I said yes. I knew I fucked up the first time when he asked me. I pretty much said no to, to a captain. Um, I was scared. I, I am going to be honest, I was scared. And I told him yes. So I run out to the middle of the cop, Krupa provides fire for me, I baseball slide into the 60, I just grabbed the 60, the, the base plate had already been planted, there was no way of pulling it out by myself. I unhook it from the base plate, I carry it in, and run back to the CP, slide in with it, and um, 
I get it all set up, ready to fire. And I had no rounds. <laughs> so the mortar system was, I just, I pretty much just risked my life to grab a mortar system that I could not fire. That's when Hayes and I decided that we needed to get ammo. We needed to resupply everybody. The mortar system just pretty much came non-existent. And so Hayes and I, we ran up to the end of the truck. We told Krupa to lay down fire. They were trying to push in. I grabbed the 9mm off an Abad's hip because I didn't have, my weapon had failed after we, well, before leaving the mortar pit. So I grabbed a Bod's 9mm, I checked it, it had three rounds, and I looked at Hayes and I was like, you ready for this? And he's like, yeah, on the count of three. And we didn't even make it to three. I swear it was like one and we just left. And we crossed down, it was probably maybe, i say about 100 meters from the CP, um, flat land, all in the open. We get to the mortar pit, we slide in the mortar pit, it's just a mess. Something with the crick got blocked up and it just started flooding the mortar pit. It was like it was planned. I know I had mentioned it before that it started it getting muddy. It flooded. And all the ammo had started to sink. And um, I grabbed 60 rounds, a case of 60 rounds. He grabs 240 ammo and and 50 cal ammo, and I grab a, bo uh, a can of 5.56. Five, and we run it up to the CP. We did about maybe six trips back, dodging bullets. Um, fastest I've ever ran in my entire life. Um, yeah, we did about six trips, and we get back to the CP, and they wouldn't clear fire for for the mortars because they said we had air support coming. So I put the, the ammo can to the side and the next move was to get ammo up to top side. I peeked my head around a corner, I didn't see anything. He's peeked his head to the right. He said it was clear and then we started climbing the terraces. And I got to the third terrace, and that's when I saw my first KIA. Um, he had been shot in the face. It pretty much looked like Predator. It was just opened up. Um, couldn't identify who it was. It, 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 it hit me. It hit me really hard. And then I went to swing to the left and go down the terrace where Phillips and Gilmore, Gilmore took over a weapon in a weapon squad um, dude maybe one of those guys who got shot and I seen Sergeant Garcia there Sergeant Garcia was split in half there's probably about a two foot gap from where his legs laid and then his intestines, his stomach and then his upper half and I dropped down to the ground and he's screaming help me, help me, help me, help me and I start packing his guts back into his cavity. I knew it wasn't. I knew it wasn't going to save him. But for me to be there, and 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 help him, maybe that made him feel better. I knew he was a lost cause. It, it was just point blank common sense. It was all right there, and that was tough. For the first year, first few years, it. Seeing Garcia like that, that he was such a just down to earth guy, and it was just he never he never asked anybody of anything. But to him that just asked to help help him, it was it was tough knowing that he was already gone. Whispered in his ear that, that everything was going to be okay, um, but I had to go and resupply the other positions that I'd be back. He he begged me not to leave. And I told him I had to. I told him I'd come back and help him as soon as I resupplied one of the positions. Hayes had split off to take his ammo higher up to top side. 
and I was getting the first terrace that was overlooking uh, the lower portion of the mosque that they were also pressing in. Uh, 50 to 75 meters and I got to um, Sergeant, Sergeant Gilmore. I gave him ammo. At that point in time I didn't see Sergeant Quick um, which was kind of heart-wrenching because there was a lot of bodies around. Um, I gave him ammo. Hayes had met back up with me. I came back and Garcia was gone by then. And that that hurt that he didn't see me again like I promised he would before he left. So you're heading back down now for more ammo? Yes, now. You're drop and you're going past him. Yep. On the way back. And um, we do this trip about maybe three times and three three rounds in the nine mil, I didn't fire a single one. I mean, it just wasn't time. I did, there wasn't time to stop and take that aim because those were three bullets that were going to protect me. So we cleared, we went through the mosque, we went through the bazaar three times and and resupplied all the positions. When I got to the crow's nest, I see McKegg, and McKegg was on a weapon system. Um, I honestly can't. Um, I remember by the time I got to the resurface, the nine had already been killed. Um, it was just more of fortifying the positions through any further um, engagement. As a private, I didn't. We, I was there three months prior, so I met so many new faces. I wasn't really, the Chosen Company brothers, they were brothers. They had been through it all for the last 15 months. So I, ha I still had the bond with them, only because we were attached to them, but it wasn't the same bond. Like Abad and I had the bond that they had with themselves. Um, so when we're attached to a company, you don't get to interact with them all at all the same time. I interacted with the majority of them because of Camp Blessing. Um, but to tell you who was there, where they were, and and to see them, um, man, if you would ask me like six, seven years ago, I could probably point it out, but now it's just, it, it's slowly faded away. So now it's just, you see bodies up there. I see bodies. So you I know where the bodies are. You resupplied. Nobody's the fight. Nobody's there fighting. But you resupplied. Yes. Because you didn't know. In that. Was it the second time when you went back? Everybody was dead. The first time. The third time. I don't quite understand. The, the first time I seen two bodies, and that was Garcia, and who I believe was Pruitt, that got shot in the face. Um. The second time. I seen somebody crouched over like they were praying. That was believed to be Lieutenant Brostrom on his way back down. Um, I seen I seen Ayers slumped over in the crow's nest, and that's when I seen McKeg. Um, everybody was moving. No one was in a certain position. Um, what do you mean they were moving? When you say everybody, you mean. You were stupid. The platoon, stand, the you were stupid to stand still. There was no cover anywhere. It was 360 coming. Exactly. In. There were so many moving parts, but the guys that were past the bazaar and 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 the mosque, they stayed in that area because you didn't know. You didn't know what was. They were fighting from the bazaar. They were fighting from the mosque, from the village, from windows and houses. They were everywhere. When I say everywhere, you could not look a certain direction and not see muzzle flash.
You may not see them, but you you would not. So we resupplied the positions three times. That's when the bird came in, and we were ecstatic. Uh, CP guys, Captain Myers, uh, Hayes, um, Stones had come down. Scantlin was down there. Um, they were gonna. They had an intermission where they were gonna drop off weapons and pick up bodies. And the first bird came in. They slung in what was to believe weapon systems. And Scantlin and I, we went out to the DZ. No cover. Krupa had had us covered, but his he, he was only getting three round bursts with his 50 cal before he had to clear and load the chain again. And, shoot and clear it they were failing we got out to the DZ and I tell you what man all I seen was AT fours eighteen fours and a couple cases of of ammo and I remember sitting there uh, against the sod wall looking at the stuff just laying all over the ground because they just dropped it and it wasn't they just flew in dropped that shit and got out because a lot of times, we didn't have time for medevac. They said it was too hot to, to land. A bod would have been saved. If he would have gotten treatment, he would have been saved. Half those guys up on top side, other than the ones that were blatantly killed, could have been saved. But medevac wouldn't land. They wouldn't land, it was too hot. They had to wait for air support to come in. So medevac was just flying around in the, the next surrounding valley. They were just cruising around waiting for air support to come in, waiting for things to calm down. But that sling load of ammo came in, and I remember looking at Scantlin like, what the fuck are we supposed to do with AT4s? I was like, who the fuck packed this sling load? Like, there's there's maybe one or two or three rifles, and maybe 10 cases of ammo, and then there was like 40 AT4s, which are the, the pretty much rockets. Yeah, they're like the bazooka thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Uh, they're not like the law. The law is like a grenade launcher, just. Oh. But they they were like rockets. Okay. Um, there was like 40 of these AT4s, and experiencing this all, even if you were to grab that AT4, you end up killing yourself. I mean, you're fighting guys 10 feet away from you. And in the bazaar, and, and they were pretty much worthless. So we grabbed the ammo, we grabbed a few rifles, we made our way back to the CP, and that's when I seen Sergeant Phillips. Sergeant Phillips came back down. He grabbed the rifles, he took them back, and he took the ammo back. Um, Scantlin had been doing uh, medical treatment all around. Um, I don't know exactly he where he was. All that. Yeah, he was all over the place too. Yeah. Um, like I said, not one person was in one area. That you couldn't. If you stayed in one area, you were gonna die. It, it was just a non-stop. Just, just keep moving. It didn't matter if I was next to the CP. I was, I was moving in front of the truck, firing, coming back to the truck, firing around the edge. It was just returning fire, keep moving. You didn't want them to keep put a beat on you. And you didn't know where they were. Um, Did Meyer know at this point the top side was basically lost? Um, I can't talk for another man. Yeah. Did, um, did you guys try to retake top side at any point? Or re, as far as like go up there? To, that was the first initiating aspect. That's when, when we first got to the CP. Mm -hmm. And they said that topside need reinforcements. That's when Quick, Gilmore, and, and Phillips had left. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to be the first first movement of reinforcements mm -hmm. because that's all there was. For there was there there was there was three positions. It was topside, the crow's nest, which the crow's nest was the surrounding little area was is pretty much the gate entrance that led us through the bazaar across the road um, and then you had topside the crow's nest and then you had the, the CP and the mortar pit well at the CP it's only Captain Myers and his RTO 
and um, I think there could have been a medic there. Hewitt may have been there Doc first. Hewitt got the first reinforcements OP top side was um, Brostrom, Hoader, and Hewitt. Yes. And when they got out, and went, right when they got over the wire to go up to the OP, Hewitt took one in the right arm and almost blew his arm off. So he yep. was down. So Scantlin took over, but Scantlin was working on a bot. Yes. Scantlin was keeping a bot alive, and Scantlin told me, he says, look, he had to make a decision. He worked on it for like 15 minutes. and had him going, and Scantlin says if the birds would have landed, he would have been safe. Yeah. There's no doubt. And he said he, he was raising hell. Why will not the birds land? Why will not the birds land? So he finally had to make a decision. The other people, he, his arm was hanging off, literally. Walker had been shot through the wrist. His was hanging on by a tendon. And the other guys were being shot. Um, um, the guy that got shot in the leg, nuts. Uh, Chavez. Chavez got shot and almost got his nuts off, and he was bleeding out. So Scantlin had to work on these other guys and leave a bottle on. And he told somebody, one of the soldiers held compressions on by to wait on the bird to get here, and Scantlin moved on. That was me. That was you, that's right. Because so, that's what Bob gave me his last words. That's right. That's exactly right. And then so Hovader and Brostrom, Brostrom wanted to reinforce the OP and was got in an uh, argument three times with Myers told him to stand down three times. He said, and he said the order him, do not go. You know, you don't know what's up there, you don't know what's left, you, you don't go to the OP. Brostrom finally raised hell and got in an argument with Captain Myers and said, I'm fucking going. He said, fine, grab a couple of pins and go. So he grabbed Hovater and Doc Hewitt because he knew the people that were shot down. So Hewitt got hit right off the bat. He was done. He was out of the fight because he literally like lost his whole shoulder and arm. So they made it up there. They yeah, took, just the two made it. Just the two made yeah. it. And two soldiers I've talked to witnessed the actual run. Okay, His son was one of them. And his son will not go on camera. He's working in, as a deputy sheriff in Kentucky. He ain't talked about it to this day. He talked to him on the phone. He said, I saw him run. I saw which way they go. I saw bullets flying off of them, literally going through their pack. He said, they finally went out of sight. He said, I thought that was the end of them. He said, I thought I'd never see them again, which he never did. So they get up to the OP, and uh, Gobble and, and Stafford would look around the lower part, and they were crawling around, checking for, see if anybody was alive. Nobody was left. They said, you know, they checked through it. He was gone. Hovater, his face was gone. Um, Ayers was dead. Phillips was dead. Bogart couldn't be found. He was dead. And he said, we got to make a decision. They crawled up. They, they hollered for pits a couple times. And then the second time you hollered for pits, the shots came in. They realized they heard them, so they had to be quiet. And... Stafford, you know, his teeth was blown out, his face was all fucked up, gobble was fucked up, and uh, bleeding bad, and their guns wouldn't hardly fire, and neither one of them could stand, and he said they crawled around, and the last thing they didn't want to do was leave a man behind, and they, they accounted for everybody except Zewilling, which was blown out of the OP, and they couldn't find, they couldn't, never saw Pitts. But they knew Brosham was down too. But they knew Pitts was... A lie, they heard pits before because when Brostrom got up there and Hubbard got up there, they both confirmed on a documentary tape that they heard Brostrom talking to pits. And pits on his interview says that. So that was the last time they heard Brostrom and Hubbard. They all got killed. So anyway, Gobble. Well, what was that bit about? He's behind the rock. He's behind the rock. Well, Pruitt was injured. He was shot. Pruitt had six ballistic wounds and was you know missing fingers and elbows and but Pruitt um, when he got up there Pruitt was between Hovader and Brostrom and Pruitt from what I was told Gobble thought he heard Pruitt I mean Stafford said he thought he heard Pruitt say this way and showed Brostrom where Pitts was so they first time Pitts anybody heard from Pitts he started communicating with Brostrom so about that time, um, a guy kept coming over the, the rock, raking the KK-47 up through the um, OP, and Pruitt still kept hollering and exposing himself, going, he's right behind that rock, he's right behind that fucking bike, but the one's behind the sandbags. And then they threw in a couple grenades, and there was some more screaming, they heard Pruitt holler, and then 
the guy came back up and raked through the OP again, and that's when Stafford and Goffle both say, being they were right there on the ground, that that's when it totally went solid. So that guy with the hand grenades and the bullet in the AK-47, which makes sense because Brostrom had five ballistic wounds, Hovader had four ballistic wounds, complete bullets, super fragged, 130 to 140 plus fragments, and Pruitt took, exposed himself to try to warn Hovader and Brostrom to get him out of the way when he got shot directly in the face. So that's according to the Army's investigation as well. Uh, and according to the autopsy um, of Hovader, I'm sorry, we read through the, ho the autopsies of Brostrom and Pruitt. And, that, and that's when the Army lied to us you know, and said Pruitt was only killed by a single gunshot wound to the torso. And that's why we received his body with an open casket. And that's when they told us at the funeral home, he says, I can't give you an open casket. And I was like, you got to. And he's only shot in the stomach. And he said, you need to come look at your son. And that's when me and my parents. And Sorry. Okay, but that's inside the OP. That's inside the wire. Pissed us all off. And it finally happened. And. I took a bod to the bird. He was the he was the first to go. They they dropped out the HLZ, and it was a bod and some some A and A that we dragged out to the birds. And I told the combat medic not to let anything happen to a bod. I don't care if he's dead or not. Don't let anything happen to him. And uh. They, they fly from the HLZ and they try to land up at top side. And uh, so I'll go up the to top side to help with those bodies. And it was so hard. Moving your best friend that had sat there through hours of pain hours of agony just because birds didn't want to land. Birds didn't want to do gun runs. Birds didn't want to do anything. Birds didn't want to come until an hour after the firefight started. And just seeing that your best friend died because of somebody else's decision. I guarantee some of them would have survived. But carrying your buddies to a bird it was hard. And watching your wounded buddies leave, and you're just like, well, what did I do wrong? I mean, 11 Bravos, they relied on us so much. Being 11 Charlie, when, when shit happens, it's 11 Charlie, it's that 60. That 16, that 120, that starts rocking and saves, saves our brothers. And knowing that I only got off, that me and Sarfils only got off four rounds, knowing that I never even got to shoot the 60 because I was just way too busy. I should have been doing my job. It just, it haunts me to this day, knowing that I look at all the things that I could have done that I didn't. But then I look at it to this fact that if I didn't deliver ammo to all these fighting positions, they would have never held them back. And there would have been more casualties. So it's a lose-lose situation. <laughs> you never win. And uh, things, things start to calm down. And uh, the higher ranking people start coming in. We knew it was gonna happen. All the big boys got rolling in. All our weapons were destroyed. None of them worked. Nothing worked. And uh, 
So they give us their weapons. I mean, I remember getting Lieutenant Colonel Austin's rifle. I was like, yeah, this is cool. This is cool. And uh, so they're giving us their weapons and they're taking ours, which ain't gonna work because they're just gonna go back to a fob and be safe anyways. And I swear, not an hour later, a bird comes in and tells us they need their weapons back. First of all, we're waiting on the Pentagon to tell us if we can leave or not. Guy's behind a desk that he heard the story, heard what happened, but wasn't there. They get to make the decision on if we're going to stay or not. Okay. Now you're going to take my take a rifle out of my hands, a working rifle, and put a rifle or no weapon in my hands, and then you're going to still have us sit here and decide if we're going to stay or not. That's a no-go. That, that pissed us off when they came back and got those rifles. Because either A, we didn't have rifles, or B, we did, it. they just didn't work. Either the barrels were shot off, the ACOGs were broken, or like my rifle I had around welded inside it because I shot it so much. I, it was just unbelievable. So, a few days go by and we finally, it's like day three. Day three goes by and uh, we're like, we're still here. It only took them four days to make that complex attack. Day four, they're gonna come back and we have nothing. Still no food, still no water. Even after the firefight, nothing. We were tired. Yeah, we had soldiers come in for QRF teams. They yeah, had Able Company. Battalion mortars came out to replace the, us with the company mortars just so that we could have a break. Still no food, though. Still no water. Still no ammo. Same weapons. And it was day three. And we were just like, unbelievable, unbelievable. So it, it, it all came together. It was like, this had been the worst mission ever. Just the way it was planned, just the way that the leadership hung us out to dry, just the way that they still left us out there to dry, even when they know what we went through. Even when those high-ranking people came out and seen what we were going through, they just went home and went on with their day. So late, late day three after the firefight, it was finally decided that we, we were getting out of there. Boy, was I happy. I will destroy everything I just made. I will bury every foxhole I slept in. I will knock over every hisco I can. I will shoot every mortar I can. Get rid of everything. As long as I know I'm getting out of this hell. And then we got out. And uh, getting back to Camp Blessing, no one talked to us. No one said, good job, you made it. No one said, uh, wow, man, I feel sorry for you. It was just like it never happened. Like it was brushed underneath the rug. I, I remember going to my hooch, sitting on my hooch, looking across, and what was supposed to be a Bod's area was totally cleared out. There was nothing of his there. And that's when it really hit me. That's when it really hit me when I, I just lost my best friend. He's not in my life anymore. I broke down all the plans that we had made, everything, just, I broke down. And it hurt. How did it make you feel when you pull it out three days later? After losing nine soldiers. It pissed me off. I was heated. 
I was, I couldn't believe how a guy behind a desk could just make a decision of the remaining survivors of, of a battle that just happened. Uh, how could a guy in the Pentagon just sit there and be like, hmm, should these guys stay or go? Did he not have a clue what just happened? How much blood was lost on that land? Exactly. I mean, do you really want us to stay there after what we just went through? I'm sorry, I just lost nine of my best friends. How would you feel if you lost nine of your best friends? It's like tearing out your heart nine times in a row. It gets torn out, put back in. Oh, let's tear it out again. Nine times. And it's just, it kills. And then just to have some guy that sits behind a desk, some big hot shot in the Pentagon, make a decision on either if we're gonna stay or if we're gonna go. It pissed me off. Obviously, the right answer would have been, get the fuck out. Obviously, we're not, we don't belong there. Okay, they made their point. But to sit there for, to, to take three days, how could you go home to your wife and children knowing that you have the decision of the remaining survivors of a battle of Wunat and they're still sitting there. How could you go home to your wife and children and eat your dinner? I couldn't do it. Day two, uh, no. Day three, come on, give me something here. It took them four days to make this complex attack against us and we're just skimming day four coming up I was just waiting for another attack. We were all just waiting for another attack. I sat there, I had three mags left. Three magazines left out of like 60 mags that I brought with me. Three mags left. I sat there and counted every single bullet on my free time. I have this many bullets. I have 92 bullets. That's a little over three mags. How many mortar rounds do we have? This many. 120 each shot can be used. Day three. Oh, you're going home. It took you three days. Are you kidding me? How'd you sleep that night? And a few days later, they just decided to hold a memorial for the nine fallen soldiers. And uh, some higher ranking guys come in. Okay, they're gonna pay their respects. But they were disrespectful. During the whole memorial, they left their chopper running. Um, moment of silence, all you could hear is their chopper just running. That was probably gonna be the day I was gonna get kicked out because I was gonna punch some colonel, some major, some general, just punch them because it was so disrespectful. How hard was it for you just to turn off your bird? Are you really that important that you need that running during a memorial? Um, but the memorial was at Camp Blessing. It had the nine boots, rifles, helmets, dog chains with the pictures. And we all spoke. And it was just so disrespectful. So disrespectful. And you know, it. You think of it, you're like, maybe they didn't mean it. Maybe they didn't understand. But how could you not understand? You got a Black Hawk just screaming in the back when you're in the middle of a moment of silence. That's not what I not, That's not what I want to hear when it's supposed to be a moment of silence. I should hear peacefulness. I should hear nothing in a moment of silence. It's called honor. It's, it's called... It's, it, that ticked me off. <clears throat> what do you want the country to know? What do you want the country to remember about the battle one out in the chosen few? <sighs> A lot of 
when you ask me that, what I want people to know about the battle of why not. I want them to know it wasn't like any other firefight that soldiers may talk about. This this firefight had had to be one of the most heroic, one of the most courageous firefights known to mankind. To have an overpowering of Taliban force rain hell on a specific amount of 25 men and how we just held our ground. That's, that's more than any just random little firefight. I want them to know that even though we held our ground, we did it in with the littlest, littlest necessities. We had nothing. We were out there to dry and we still drove on. I mean, I want people to know that in all you can do whatever your mind puts your what you can do whatever you put your mind to. I mean, we went days without food and water, and we held off 150 plus Taliban for a good straight six eight hours without sleep, without food, without water. I want people to know that it's nobody's fault that was on the ground. It wasn't Lieutenant Brostrom, it wasn't Captain Myers, it wasn't this Joe, or this private, or this sergeant. I want them to know that we were just doing what we were told. There's, there's things online where I read, well, how, how can a, uh, a Taliban force overrun uh, a U.S. soldier's post? Aren't they trained, though? build up their fobs, don't they have fob security, don't they have all these assets to them, birds, helicopters, blah, blah, blah. People jibber-jabbering about stuff they don't know. I want them to know that we had nothing. We had our trucks, our brothers, and our ammo. That's all we had. That's all we needed. We didn't need anything else. Because we, we got the job done with or without it. I want people to know that. A chosen few. As being a chosen few, or if I was on the outside of being chosen few, um, to me, being a chosen the chosen few, it's an honor. I know that I was in the original chosen few that survived when not, that survived two deployments in the exact same area. And for somebody who is about to be chosen few, you have some boots to fill. You have some great soldiers who fought hard, who drove on day after day without anything, without talking to their families. The words chosen few mean just what they mean. They are chosen few. It's God's chosen few. That's who we are.